An altogether different approach to controlling translation levels is to employ specialized parts. In this study from the Biofab, the authors employed bisystronic operons to make the biology behave more like simple models. Previous studies, such as the Plotkin one, show that much of the variation in expression can be eliminated by fusing about 37 base pairs of constant sequence to the 5' prime end of an open reading frame. Since most aspects of gene expression deal with sequence entirely in the 5' prime UTR or the first 37 base pairs of the coding sequence, locking in this sequence of this region has the desired effect of eliminating most of the causes of variable expression. However, many proteins will not tolerate an N-terminal fusion peptide, and there are also concerns about reusing long stretches of exact DNA sequence in a design due to the potential for recombination and excision of the introduced genes. In contrast, the bisystronic method uses the normal start codon for the protein, but it places a second initiation site just upstream. Their constructs look like this. They place an upstream insulator sequence to prevent any transcription from entering this region of the DNA. They then put in a conventional promoter, the sequence that gets transcribed, and then a constant 3' UTR terminator and more insulation. The novelty of the construct is within the region that is transcribed. The 5' UTR contains two ribosome binding sites. The first one, SD1, initiates translation of Cistron1, which encodes a short peptide of arbitrary sequence. The second ribosome binding site, SD2, is superimposed over Cistron1 and defines the strength of translation of the downstream gene encoded by Cistron2. The Cistron2 is the gene that you're actually trying to, to express. The idea here is that translation initiation is an uncertain process, but when two ORFs are cosystronic in close proximity like this, the same ribosome will proceed from the first coding sequence to the next without re-equilibrating. Thus there is only one round of dissolving the secondary structure for the construct, and initiation from the second cistron will be more reliable. They design libraries based on this bisystronic sequence in which Cistron2 is the GFP open reading frame, so they can watch it using various fluorescence methods. They saturate key minus 10 and minus 35 regions of the promoter and the Cistron1 sequence around the second ribosome binding site. They screen through the diversity in the same way we've seen before with constitutive promoters, and from this they construct families of promoter sequences and SD2 sequences that span three orders of magnitude in expression. To test their hypothesis that this will better regulate translation, they make a direct comparison of their bisystronic constructs to single cistron constructs. In figure A, the mRNA will contain an SD2 sequence, the first 36 base pairs of arbitrarily chosen genes, and then either RFP or GFP. In figure B, the SD2 sequence is placed in the bisystronic context, but the same 36 base pair arbitrary protein sequence is the N-terminus for each encoded protein, as is whether it's GFP or RFP. Thus, the two sets only differ by variation in the 5' UTR. What they observe from this is very poor correlation with the conventional constructs. However, with the bisystronic constructs, there is tight correlation between choice of SD2 sequence and expression level. They also construct a 14 promoter cross 22 ribosome binding site library of constructs for GFP and RFP based on the bisystronic context. In these plots, they show the different chosen promoters from left to right and different strength ribosome binding sites from top to bottom. The relative fluorescence of each strain is indicated by the heat map. When they employ simple translation models to describe this variation, they find that they can account for most of the variation in these experiments by considering just two parameters, a strength for each promoter and strength for each RBS.